Jeff Siegel. Hey, Bourbon, how are you? I love your office setup. Unclean office, clean mind. Yeah, that's right. That's right. In making season three of Home Diagnosis, I had all these different researchers saying all these different things. And of course, everyone knows that high CO2 levels are not healthy for people. Specifically, they're bad for human cognition, that there's like brain defects that we're going to develop from this. So I reached out to you like, hey, I've got this guy saying this thing, and I just wanted to give a graphic. We all know this, but I just want to give a quick graphic where the like warning levels of CO2, carbon dioxide in the air is. And you wrote back to me. Yeah, I said there is no no unsafe levels as far as we know. So two things that are really important to say right at the beginning of this. CO2 is an indicator. It's an indicator of people breathing out CO2 more than it's being removed by ventilation. And so CO2 concentration should be seen as, um, A, maybe your ventilation system isn't doing what you want, but that's kind of separate from any impact. And then the second point really big at the start is indoor air quality and cognition is this huge field. It's in its infancy. But the very short answer is that um, it is very murky whether CO2 has a cognitive impact at all. And I believe based on, on the evidence as I see it, that CO2 does not have any cognitive impact up to as high as people have cared to measure. So I heard this from you and my audience right now is like, what? You're all feeling yeah. the same way I felt. I mean, it was just like, Jeff is saying something I've never heard anybody say before. So then I was like, okay, well, first of all, everybody should know. I believe whatever Jeffrey Siegel says, if he says something about HVAC science, that's what it is. So now can you please expound upon the sure. study you researched and what you mm -hmm. found about those studies and then the study you ran yourself on this? Yeah. Okay. So to be very clear, we have run studies on other things besides CO2 because we think that CO2 is not the, the causative actor. And so, but let's start with the research. So uh, about three or four years ago, a student named Bowen Du, a graduate student, wrote a very nice paper that was a review of all the studies we could find that looked at CO2 and cognitive performance. And at the time that paper came out, it was published in 2020, there were 36 or 37 studies that measured CO2 and cognitive performance. And if you look at that whole literature, the very big message is there is a ton of variation. Sometimes high CO2 uh, affects cognitive performance, and sometimes it doesn't. And so what's going on? Uh, and so there are a few clues about what's going on. So the first clue was that the way you measure cognition is really complicated. And I'm not an expert in that. That's something that we collaborate with psychologists about. But what the CO2 results showed is there were two very high profile studies that showed a big impact of CO2 and they both used the same cognitive battery. So if you just looked at those two studies and you valued that cognitive battery, yeah, sure, CO2 has an impact. But if you look at all those uh, uh, you know, 36 studies, that impact was not apparent at all. The variation was way stronger than the impact. And so what Bowen did is he divided those studies into kind of two groups, studies that elevated the CO2 by adding CO2 to the air. So you can imagine a study that um, you know, has a cylinder of CO2, they release it into the air, that makes the CO2 go up. And then studies that made the CO2 go up by reducing the ventilation rate. And what Bowen found is that with the exception of those two studies, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second, in general, studies that reduce ventilation showed consistently a pretty strong cognitive effect, but those that added CO2 did not, with some variation and some exceptions. So what that tells me is that it's not CO2, it's something that goes along with when we reduce ventilation that's causing the effect. The other piece that came to light was there was a study that used the same battery as those two studies that added CO2 and found the cognitive effect. And they did it in a pretty nice study done very well controlled. But the study population was submariners, military people who are in submarines. So they went into a submarine simulator 
and uh, they expose them to very high levels of CO2, scary high levels of CO2, like the, like what? you know, not like 20,000, uh, I think was one of the the points, you know. So yeah. just, uh, just to just to repeat, he said 20,000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who write to me and say, hey, my daughter's bedroom gets to be 1200 at night. I'm a little worried. Right. You can feel yeah, better. Yeah. So, so what did they find? Yeah. And they found that um, there was no significant difference. Again, this is with the same battery that did show a cognitive uh, uh, difference. And in fact, I mean, it wasn't significant. So probably I shouldn't say it statistically significant, but the submariners actually performed better at the high level of CO2 than they did at the lower, more normal levels of CO2. Okay. And this but isn't just a bunch of macho guys who are like, yeah, yeah take it breathe it yeah yeah i actually think that's actually a very insightful way of looking at it because what we say in the review paper is there's lots of co2 testing done on specialized populations jet fighter pilots astronauts submariners and that shows a very different set of results so maybe there is something different about people who are routinely exposed to high levels of co2 do you think it's possible, and I know you're not a toxicologist, but um, mm -hmm. have you heard anyone say that it's possible that just like we have poisons that you could acclimate your body to over time and kind of build an immunity to, do you think it's possible that people like submariners could mm -hmm. have an immunity to CO2 or whatever it is in the air that's causing that cognitive thing? Great question. Great question. And one that, again, like there's limits in my ability to actually answer it. Uh, both my parents are psychologists. Uh, I don't know if you know that about me. And so I have to be, I mean, it explains a lot. But the first thought is we know that adaptation is huge for a lot of things. So uh, an example is drug tolerance. Uh, you will have very different tolerance to drugs depending on, for example, environmental cues. This is my father's whole research uh, program was about that. So if you're a coffee drinker and you go through a ritual, maybe you make coffee every morning in your coffee pot, you smell coffee, everything else. In one day in a blind controlled experiment, your coffee beans are switched with decaf coffee beans. You will have a response as if you took a depressant not just that you didn't get your 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 stimulant, but your body was conditioned to expect that stimulant to come. So your tolerance went up for the stimulant. And uh, and so, you, you know, you'll crash even harder. It's true for a drug overdose as well. People are more likely to overdose in unfamiliar environments for the same reason. And there's all kinds of environmental cues, only some of which I think we understand. So I think there's a huge impact I've never been on a submarine, but I'm told that they're loud and that they're stinky. They're constantly controlling, removing CO2 and other things from the air so that the air can be rebreathed. You know, it's a environment where, um, you know, I don't know if you're immune to CO2, but your body has really probably adapted to those circumstances. Now, where it gets a little bit tricky is there's probably a boundary between uh, a like you're not going to make yourself immune to a poison in real life. You know, there's still going to be health effects and it depends probably a lot on the mechanisms and other things going on. But for something like cognitive impacts, I think there's probably that adaptation plays a huge role. As a testing person, not mm -hmm. academic, you're way more mm -hmm. of a, an academic building scientist than I, but it strikes me that like, is it possible that not only did, were they not controlling for all the factors physically with the physics and chemistry of what they were looking at, but also these behavioral batteries of tests, is it possible that it's like the IQ test now that we know, or like the SAT more mm -hmm. classically, it's, it's a test of your zip code. It's not a test of right. actual anything. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, you just opened up a huge can of worms. And oh, no. so, uh, and it's a can of worms that I'm only somewhat qualified to talk about. So I'm going to be a little bit careful here. But yes, there are lots of different cognitive tests out there. There's lots of companies that sell cognitive tests. A lot of times they can demonstrate that their cognitive tests mean something in particular contexts. So for example, if you're interviewing people for a job, there are people who can demonstrate that, hey, if someone does better on the cognitive test, they're going to do better in certain metrics on job performance. So that type of thing is out there. 
for sure. Uh, but there's also some tests that are entirely closed. It's a closed ecosystem. They, you, uh, you pay them money, you administer the test, you send them the results, they send you the report. They don't tell you the equations, the, the, the normalizing they do, they don't tell you anything. And so, um, so there's this whole issue that you know, is hotly debated in psychology about open tests versus closed tests. What is the test actually measuring? What do the results mean? I mean, cognitive performance, I think anyone can understand. That's a really complicated thing. Any individual, I have very different cognitive performance when I wake up in the morning uh, than I do uh, a few hours later. There is a little bit of evidence that came out after our review paper that I think is kind of interesting. A very nice study looking at airline pilots and flight simulators. And they found the CO2 effect in terms of number of errors they made in the flight simulator, which is something you can measure, but they only found that effect at the highest level of difficulty of the whatever was being tested in the, in the simulator. So that's kind of further evidence that, hey, this effect might not be an ordinary everyday thing. This might be a, a special thing. And then the last comment I'll make is a study that came out relatively recently. Uh, was more like an exercise physiology study than it was, but they did look at cognitive effects and they exposed people to these same crazy high levels. I think, again, it was 20,000 uh, ppm and um, they found nothing uh, in any of the exercise physiology metrics they were measuring as well as any of the cognitive uh, measures. And again, I think that there is this, um, you know, there is this this really important question about you know, is CO2 the agent that's causing these cognitive effects at all? I don't think it is. The other thing is, you know, I think we have to be so careful about how we do this cognitive testing, because all of a sudden, you know, are we testing things uh, at maybe the extremes? So maybe someone had a stressful day, maybe the subway broke down on their way to get to the test. So they were afraid they were going to be late. And maybe that affects their performance on the cognitive test more than, you know, the small change in CO2 level. I think like the most important take home message here is that I would be very, very cautious about saying, hey, CO2 has a cognitive impact. Um, I don't believe it does. There are probably other people who think that it, it does have an impact and you know that's a good discussion and more research we should do. Almost anyone would probably agree that that impact is not going to be uniform. It's going to be different over different times for the same individual, and it's going to be certainly different for different populations. Great. So to be clear, keep measuring your CO2 in your homes, everybody, in your offices, in your cars, if you really want to be scared. I don't know if you do that, Jeff, but I do, and I stopped because it is so so scary. Don't try to tackle that as the only thing. It's a marker, like Jeff is saying. So please do make sure that you comment below if you have other things to add. Like, subscribe. Tune in next time.